Hi, I'm Dr. Derek Lee. It's my pleasure to introduce, reintroduce for her second appearance, uh, Dr. Michelle Wellborn, who's Chief of Spine Surgery at Shriners Hospital for Children, Portland. Also an Assistant Professor of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation at Oregon Health Sciences University. Welcome. Hey, Derek, it's nice to see you again. Same, same, absolutely. Yeah. Now today, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, early onset scoliosis, and you're an expert in EDF casting, metacasting. And I was kind of um, surprised at how little I know on this topic. And I thought I was up to speed on scoliosis. And when you hear that with this particular method, EDF casting, you can get anywhere in terms of a real cure from what 35 to 69% of um, infantile idiopathic uh, scoliosis cases. I was kind of shocked because I never really associated cure with scoliosis because you know i'm always thinking once you have scoliosis that's it right and then it may be surgical if it gets to severe um cob angle that type of thing so you today you're going to walk us through that whole topic okay yeah so um you know it's not surprising lots of people don't know much about early onset scoliosis it's really a subspecialty within a subspecialty and so even a lot of surgeons are, are not up to speed on this particular topic. I am blessed to have come from a lineage of early onset scoliosis surgeons, all of whom were trained by Min Meta uh, and other surgeons uh, before her who had done different casting techniques. And basically casting has evolved over 150 years. And you know, if you think about it, we didn't even know that bracing really worked until Stu Weinstein came out with the brace studies. And that was in the 2000s. That was when they put temperature sensors in brace and showed, hey, you know what? If you don't wear it, it doesn't work. But if you do, it does, you know? Well, the cool thing about a cast is that you can't take it all. So if you apply a really good cast, you take that compliance factor out of it and you really can change the curve, you know? In our last talk, we talked about growth and we talked about all the research that we're doing in growth. And this is taking that in some ways to the next level because with metacasting, what you really do is you harness the power of growth. You're a parent, I'm a parent. You remember when your kids were really small, under the age of one, you, it was like you bought new clothes all the time, right? Yes, so you're constantly- too. I, know. I had twins, trust me. I, we went through so many diapers. But if you're, they're doubling in size when they're really early, young. And so what Min Meta had kind of described was the idea that, so growth can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. We know that our bones grow in response to the stress on them. So if you squeeze it, if you, the inside of the curve has more pressure on it, you're going to slow the growth down and the outside of the curve, you're going to grow faster because that side has less pressure. Well, what she talked about with casting was reversing that process, basically unloading the inside and loading the outside. So that way you could actually grow the spine straighter. Part of that is why we have so much variability. And so what we'll do today is we can run through some information about this, because I think this is something that so many of us need to know but more about. Um, and because I think that if we better understand the background, then you can understand why it's necessary, why we need to basically torture a whole bunch of toddlers with casts, and why, in fact, it's actually like the best thing ever that we're doing for them. What do you think about that? Sound good? Sounds terrific. Let's get started. As far as EDF casting, basically, this is something that we do in very young kids. So when we talk about early onset scoliosis, this is specifically going to be referring to those youngest of kids. This is specifically going to refer to uh, kids in general. We don't typically start casting on kids over the age of five, but every once in a while, there's a reason for it. Most kids that we start casting on are even younger than that. So again, early onset scoliosis is less than 10 years of age. There was some great articles that really describe that, but most of the time when we talk about it, we're gonna be breaking it down by the causative factor. That can be idiopathic, which basically means we don't know why, though that's probably genetic. 
uh, it can be congenital or structural. So this is where there's a bony thing different. So that can be a hemivertebrae, which means only part of a vertebra formed instead of a whole one. It can be a block or a bar where two vertebrae fused in some way. Um, it can also be things where the bone kind of was damaged by things nearby. So that can be kids with neurofibromatosis. So there's lots of different reasons that can cause congenital scoliosis. Neuromuscular scoliosis is basically when we have a muscle or a nerve imbalance. And a lot of these kids, especially those kids that are in wheelchairs, develop scoliosis and they develop it very young. And then syndromic scoliosis is gonna be with kids that are have some underlying syndrome but they don't have a muscle or bony reason for that. So that can be kids with ligamentous laxity, like kids with Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos. And part of this is important because we can cast all of these kids if their scoliosis develops when they're particularly young. So we're talking kids that are one, two, three years old. Um, any situation where we're really trying to buy time and avoid surgery as long as we can. Because once you make an incision, you can't go back, right? That incision is there. So with infantile scoliosis, this is the area where casting really shines. You had mentioned potentially curing these kids. These are the kids that we really can do that. So overall, that's going to be kids that are less than three. Again, no identifiable cause, um, though I think, again, in the next five to 10 years, we're going to have a lot more good genetics. But why is that is so important? Well, it's important because this profoundly impacts the lung development. These kids are developing like crazy during this time. And our lungs, the way that they develop is actually, they're like thousands of tiny little balloons. And those little balloons are actually dividing and multiplying. And so if you compress them, they don't do that. So for kids with infantile scoliosis, they have fewer little balloons for air and they have less space for that. So it's a double whammy. So they're over seven times more likely to have severe lung disease. And if you even just compare them to AIS, right? These are kids who, you know, get scoliosis in their teens or tweens. They're profoundly worse than those kids. And this can actually be a cause of death in these patients. So it significantly impacts their quality of life and it can actually cause them to pass away earlier. So really has a huge impact on lung function. If we look at congenital scoliosis, this is really common. And this is something that we're born with typically. They tend to have lots of other things going on. So any of these kids, you want to make sure to check them out from head to toe and make sure that there's nothing else going on, like their heart or their lungs or their kidneys, because it actually all forms at the same time, uh, which I think some of us don't realize because we only think about the bones. <laughs> and the neuromuscular stuff, you know, there is so much here that can be done. A lot of these kids, again, they're developing scoliosis at one or two, especially if they're not walking. And so really having a good algorithm for handling these kids and making sure that you make sure they're nice and healthy um, before you do anything can be really important. And delaying that surgery is really helpful. So what are things that make you more likely to get worse and more likely to get worse quicker? So one, if there's a driving force. So if the bone is different, if the muscles or nerves are different, those kids get worse rapidly. The kids that aren't walking because they're not strong enough, so they generally have a muscle imbalance. They get worse more quickly. The younger you are when this develops, again, we talked about how our bones grow in response to the stress. So if you have pressure on it, and if you think about it, the inside of the curve is going to have pressure on that. That's going to get worse more quickly. So the younger you are with the bigger curve, the more likely that's to get worse. And one of the things that we commonly look at is this thing called the rib vertebral angle difference. So what that is, is that basically looking at how much rotation you have. And especially for those families with kids with early onset scoliosis, uh, you'll probably notice that on one side, all those ribs are really squeezed together. And on the other side, those kids, those ribs are really spread apart. We see this in the adolescent kids as well, but you see this to a greater extent in the younger kids. Um, and so we can actually measure that. And that's one of the big things that tells us about how likely you are to get worse. And then rib phrase is really, again, just talking about that rotation. 
So you'll hear your doctor throwing around these terms, and now you know what they are. Um, and they're really helpful for telling us how quickly this is going to progress. So when we think about treatment, it's really important to be able to break that down into who can I watch? Who do I not need to watch? And if I am not watching, what do I need to do about it? So one of the things that's cool about infantile idiopathic scoliosis is that actually some of those kids will go, the curves will go away on their own. That's the really young kids with smaller curves. Part of why some of those kids have curves is because they're just not that strong. And so they just kind of like slouch. And so as their core gets stronger, as they start to stand, as they start to walk, they actually automatically correct it themselves. So small curves without a lot of rotation are probably just more a result of posture and core strength. So we watch those closely. And as long as they're getting better on their own, we actually don't need to do anything about it. We don't need to expose them to anesthesia unnecessarily, which is huge. We don't need a brace. We don't need to torture the parents or the patient. Bracing. So bracing is something that we can do. Um, there in the past wasn't good data associated with this, but the group out of Harvard has been doing this and they've had some good success. Uh, it does need to be changed almost as frequently as a cast. So you're making a new brace every you know, three months or so. Um, and right now we're really trying to study its effects in different sizes of curves and kind of that longer term stuff. But actually we are part of a multi-center randomized controlled trial um, that's uh, looking at bracing versus casting. And so we offer this option as well. Um, and it's being done all around the country. It's actually being uh, headed by Stu Weinstein who did the brace study looking at AIS. Um, and now we're better trying to understand which of these two options is better. For casting, there's multiple different types of casting out there. And it's important to clarify with your surgeon which type they do. So casting's actually been around for 150 years. Um, it was first used in adults. <laughs> um, and I think as an adult, the last thing I wanna do is be in a body cast. <laughs> you know, like that sounds horrible. But they actually used to hang adults in traction uh, and then they put the cast on them. Um, it did not go well, not surprisingly. They don't have the power of growth, or at least not growth in the right direction. So um, really, this was used to kind of temporize things. Later, it got used after surgery uh, because we didn't used to have rods and screws. We didn't have hooks. So they would go in there and try to correct the curve and try to get a fusion without instrumentation. And so then people would be in a cast. And actually in the beginning, they were actually in a, the cast in bed for months and a lot of people died. Um, so not awesome. <laughs> then subsequently, the, the next stage, Risser actually studied under this and was like, you know what, we need to find a way to make this cast something that people can walk in. So again, this was actually, Risser casts were initially done after a non-instrumented fusion in adolescents and adults and, but some designed as something they could walk around in. It then kind of evolved over time uh, and gradually into a treatment form for early onset kids. Uh, Jean Dubousset uh, was a big part of that and really trying to take that concept to the next level and starting to harness that power of growth. Minmeta actually first started talking about this in 1979 and she kind of revolutionized the way that we do this because you know, hopefully everybody in this audience is really well educated and really learned, passionate about scoliosis. So you know that it's actually a three-dimensional deformity. It's not simply just a side to side, but it's actually a twisting of the spine. So if we think of that as a twisting of the spine, the logical thing is we have to untwist it. So we're EDF or metastyle casting, because the two are used inter exchangeably or interchangeably rather is you actually derotate that with your hands. Um, other techniques have used straps to do that. And, and so both of those can be effective, um, but that really showed much better uh, ability to potentially cure scoliosis. There's also some people that do bending casts out there, but right now there's nothing that's published on that, but it may be something to try if we're failing the other types of casting. When do we do this? So again, I just said a lot of people get better. So I don't want to cast somebody who's going to get better because anesthesia in a little kid isn't a great idea. But 
we can do this if the curve is over 30 degrees because the likelihood that they're going to get worse is very high. If that curve, uh, that difference between the ribs uh, or the RVAD is over 20 degrees. If the rib phase, which again talks about rotation, is over two, or if it's getting worse. If it's getting worse, it just tells you we're going down the wrong road. We want to avoid surgery as long as possible. Every study out there on those growing techniques, and I do a lot of the growing techniques, just shows that every year younger you are when you make an incision, you're more likely to have that fail, you're more likely to have complications, you're more likely to have infections. And that's because the kids have so much growing to do. Their bones are softer. There's a thousands of reasons why waiting even a year or two years can be incredibly beneficial and it can avoid additional procedures. So by, this can be to cure or buy time. So in terms of the background, so like I said, Min Meta, she is the one who's really popularized this concept. Again, prior to her study, a lot of people would do this, um, but I think a lot of people, one, didn't really know the technique well, and they really didn't necessarily believe it worked. You know, so kind of like bracing. Um, I still, to this day, see casts that are kind of just thrown on um, and without that right technique. And I think that the, the sad thing for me there is that you're losing time. You're losing the ability to harness that power of growth. And so really making sure that we do have a good and effective cast is going to be important. With Min Meadow, what she showed was that if you can get these kids before about 18 to 20 months of age, that you have an incredibly high likelihood of curing these kids. That if they're basically what she described as kind of a healthy kid with not a big curve and a not a ton of rotation, you can even cure up to 100% of those kids. Now, that excludes a lot of the kids. <laughs> Um, but overall, she actually showed as high as 69% uh, never had surgery. And I think that's a huge win. So you may have a small curve, but if you never need surgery, then that means your lungs had an opportunity to develop. You're going to breathe okay. You're going to have much less pain. You're going to be so much more functional. This is a, like a life-changing thing. Tons of other studies have been done that really have shown, again, Harnessing that power of growth, making sure they're in that really rapid phase when they're young is important. There are different studies that talk about straps versus no straps. I like to do straps in the really young kids because their bodies are just so small that really what the straps do, and you can see this kiddo here with the kind of yellow and black, is that the straps in many ways are actually reinforcing this strap here across the chest. And if you're reinforcing that strap across the chest, then you make that all stronger and you have a kind of a better grip on that rotation. These are some other casts. These are a little bit more outdated. I think everybody needs a belly hole to eat and breathe better, um, but certainly there's lots of different types out there and something like these here in the green are great. Um, and, and there's just a lot of variability in exactly how it works. Um, overall, what you wanna do though is in an ideal world, you're gonna see close to 50% correction in that first cast. And so I think asking about that, asking you know, how much correction they got, and sure, you know, if it's a little bit less than that, but close, that's a good cast. Um, but being mindful that we are getting appropriate correction, you want that cast to be tight. So it, it's gonna surprise you, but I mean, you should be able to fit your hand underneath, but only on one side at a time. If you, if you can spin it or if they can wiggle around in it, that's probably not tight enough to harness that power of growth. So you can see here, these are a bunch of studies looking at the outcomes in EDF casting, and they're really variable. And part of why it is so variable is it's really hard to teach that technique without like having it in your hands. As surgeons, we're all very tangible at people. And so if you're like, okay, we have to lift up on this and push down on this. Um, you know, how hard do I lift? Uh, and well, how big is the kid? <laughs> you know, so I think that really having somebody who does the cast, who is really knowledgeable about this, who has, if they're younger, has trained at a center that has done a lot of this. And then also just, again, don't be afraid to ask what kind of correction they got, because that's probably a good predictor of, of their chance of success. 
Um, and overall, some of these studies are mixed though because they definitely had other types of scoliosis in it. So our goals, if you're young and you're a healthy kid, you know, you should get probably about a 50% cure rate, maybe even up to 75% in the particularly young kids. The vast majority of the other kids, you're gonna palliate them. And so, you know, I say I haven't cured a kid who's still got a 15 degree curve is, and is out of a brace, uh, you know, I mean, to me, I haven't cured that kid, but if I took them from 50 degrees at two and they're 15 degrees, you know, that's pretty awesome. Uh, so the other thing is that you do have to watch those kids all the way until they're done growing because a 15 degree curve might turn into something a little bit bigger when they go through puberty and they again start to do that rapid phase of growth. And then some kids, they're just gonna get worse, especially those kids that have a bony difference or a muscular difference, they are. But if I bought two years, that's huge. If I bought three years, that's incredible. And I have a bunch of kids where we've managed to buy several years of worth of time. And, and I think that that ultimately is, is a really, really big deal. So when we look at it, so uh, Dr. Lee was saying that this kind of looks a little bit like torture and I will agree. <laughs> um, and, and so what we do is we actually put these kids in a little bit of traction and we suspend them in the air because the cast has got to go all the way around their body. It looks pretty similar to this where you put a ton of padding on them and uh, you put those arms out to the sides so that you can effectively wrap them. You actually go and you stretch them a little bit. Um, and that actually is, does a lot for the coronal curve. So that's the side to side curve. Um, and much of that correction actually happens through the traction. Then the derotation is those arrows. So what you're actually gonna do is you're gonna lift up on the chest wall and you have to be really careful that you don't let your hand rest on the side because that can actually dent the ribs in and it can do it permanently. So uh, somehow lifting but not pushing, it's like a very fine line. Um, so you lift them and then you actually will flex them away from the curve to even get an additional correction. So it's like you're walking and chewing gum while standing on your head. I don't even know if that's possible, but, but you're basically trying to do three things at once. Um, and, and it really, it, it's, an incredibly effective technique for addressing this. A lot of these kids can get cured, especially if they're a healthy kid, even if they're not a healthy kid. So there are kids with syndromic scoliosis um, that can be cured. Um, it's a much smaller number, um, but it's still possible. Um, for the kids with um, syndromic scoliosis, with neuromuscular scoliosis, for many of those kids, you can buy several years. Um, and, and for some of them, what you can do is you can get the curve a lot better and you can transition them to a brace. For those kids, uh, for kids that aren't able to talk to us normally, they're a little more likely to have a pressure sore. And so it's super, super important that we're always checking the cast. And um, we actually have a great video on the OrthoKids website that talks a lot about uh, cast care. And I think that it kind of shows you how to check the cast a little bit. And as a parent, I would just um, advocate that you uh, really make sure you take some of that in your own hands. You're looking at those, at their little bodies, making sure there's no red spots or anything like that. Um, and, and I can also say that, you know, everybody will get a rash at some point. They'll probably get a rash at least once a year. Most of the time when we get a rash, we get a rash for two reasons, one, you got sweaty. And if you get sweaty and you get your little shirt or your little cast a little moist, sweat moist against the skin just always results in a little bit of a rash or their skin gets really dry. So like your <laughs> either end of the spectrum isn't great. Um, so for the dry skin, I always encourage people to take some aquaphor and put it on your fingers and just kind of slip your fingers under the cast and rub that into their skin. It can help it from getting too dry. Um, but for those kids that have dry skin, when their cast comes off, they're probably going to scratch, scratch, scratch. Uh, so like an oatmeal bath or something like that can help. For those kids that get sweaty all the time, my families uh, can change the shirts. Um, not everybody does that. Sometimes people incorporate this shirt into their cast. But um, if that's the case, a hair dryer and cool and aiming that down the cast can help dry that out. Um, and there's lots of different techniques out there. Um, 
sometimes these curves are just getting worse and we're just failing everything. And so we've done a couple extra things. So sometimes we'll put these kids into traction for a little while. We can actually get their curve a lot better and then put them back into a cast. And we've been able to buy one to two extra years with that. Um, and, and again, for these kids where there's a lot of other things going on, that really can be a huge thing. Now, I've made it sound like casting is the greatest thing ever. Um, so you should know that it, there's definitely downside. So you can see that young man on the bottom, he's got some bruising um, and that's pretty common to see. And one of the things is that because you get a bruise in a place that you're then gonna put pressure on again, sometimes that bruise lasts for months. Most of the time it doesn't hurt, um, but sometimes you can get a little staining that uh, can last for six months or so. And that's because the bruise leaves behind uh, something called a chemosiderin, which is basically iron, um, the iron we find in our body. And that just leaves a little reddish brown tinge in that area. So sometimes there's not even a bruise, there's just a little stain of a bruise. <laughs> and, and that can last a while. As long as it's not getting worse, and as long as we're not getting a pressure sore, then we just kind of watch it. There are different lengths of time to do this. And especially if you're at a place that's a training center, it, it may take a little bit longer. And we do worry about the impact of anesthesia on the brain. So the, the positive with that is that no study has shown that that is conclusively bad. The other thing is that we know we do everything we can to minimize and avoid that. And, and ultimately, we haven't seen anything that shows that these kids are, are struggling with that, that it has impacted them. I mean, I have patients who had EDF casting, who are in college, who are brilliant, who are doing all kinds of great stuff with their lives. Um, but um, it is something that I think we're all very aware of and we really try to minimize as much as possible. Everybody's gonna get a rash. Everybody's gonna get a bruise. Uh, sometimes, again, especially part of it's technique, but part of it's also just the nature of the beast. You can have some changes in the ribs that can be temporary or permanent. Um, and there's a couple of things that were very rare that happened where um, a cast rode up under the arm too much and it did cause a blood clot in one kid and in another kid, uh, they temporarily had some pressure on the nerves, but both of those kids resolved and were fine and had no long-term consequences. But as a parent, I encourage everybody to kind of check under the arms uh, before they even go home to make sure that it's not riding up too much because the cast will ride up when they stand up. So make sure it doesn't ride up too much. And then just to feel really empowered to talk to your surgeon about any concerns that they ha you have so you can check it. Now, the other thing is that we talk about milestones. So uh, these casts are like four or five pounds. So if you have a kid who is 18 months old, they maybe weigh 15 pounds. You just increase their body weight by 25%. So those first few days, they are so pissed. <laughs> they fall over all the time if they're walking. Um, and after a couple of weeks, they'll be a lot better. But like I joke about wanting to bubble wrap your child for a few weeks, because until their core and their legs get stronger, they just tip over because they're top heavy, um, you know. And so if they're not walking, it may take them a little longer to walk because their legs have to get stronger. You know, they just have to be stronger than a kid who doesn't have a cast on. So don't worry about that. Um, potty train can be a little bit tough, but if you get those little potties with the handles, then they don't tip over on the potty. Um, because if you think about it, they have little tiny bottoms. <laughs> so um, there's lots of different things. So when I think about casting, the big thing that I do is I try to wait until they're over a year because that way the most critical brain development has already happened. And so I don't have to worry as much about the impact of the anesthesia. I want to make sure that there's nothing else potentially causing this, nothing that we can treat. Um, I get an x-ray in that first cast because I want to make sure that I did a good job with that cast. And then what I do is I keep casting until I see that their body is straight. I don't like to get a lot of x-rays because x-rays are bad for us, but I keep casting until I, that body is straight. And at that point, I know that um, you know if I get an x-ray, it's likely going to be uh, close to done or done. And then you brace these kids afterwards. So you're not done. <laughs> you don't want this to occur. So I typically will do a full-time brace for anywhere from six months to a year. Um, and then um, if they are straight and they keep being straight, um, at that point, we can switch them to nighttime and naps. And if they keep being straight, then we can take them out of the brace altogether. 
So this is one of my favorite patients. She was actually uh, one of the first ones. So I have a little bit longer follow-up on her. And you can see here, uh, this is where she started. So she actually had a 55 degree curve. You can see that up at the top um, and she's 12 months old. And so this is a pretty big curve in a 12 month old. And so we went ahead and casted her and you can see up on the upper right, her first cast and she was dramatically, dramatically better. On the bottom left, you can see her last cast. So that first cast, she still had a little bit of a curve and we definitely needed to wait a little bit longer. On that last cast, you can see she no longer has a curve. And here is what she looks like now. So she's five. Um, she was in a cast, she had six casts. Um, she then was braced for a year and a half. She has now been out of a cast or a brace for three years and she's still nice and straight. And so, you know, I think this is something where you can have such an incredible outcome. Mm -hmm. That kid on the left was going to have severe impact on their lung function. They were going to have huge, huge problems down the road, and they were likely headed towards multiple surgeries. But we harnessed that power of growth. You could see that with that cast, we got a good in-cast correction, and that was really predictive that she was going to go down a good path. And we kept her in the cast until we locked it in place. Then we were able to transition to the brace and be a little bit more liberal with that. You know, this even works in those kids with congenital scoliosis. And this was another patient who, you know, he had a lot going on and they thought you didn't need to worry about that. And unfortunately you did. And he actually got a cast somewhere else that really wasn't very good. And they switched into a brace that wasn't very good. And then he came to me and that curve was a thousand times better or a thousand times worse, not definitely better, definitely not better, much, much worse. So he's got huge curves now and he's only four. And so, you know, on the left, you can see where he was when he, when I first met him with really big curves. And you can see that when he bends, those curves are really rigid. And so mm -hmm. then on the right, you see him in my cast. And so this is a huge improvement um you know from that previous cast when his curve was actually smaller um and so we've been bracing him now for two years his curve's still in the 40s it's not cured because he's got a congenital scoliosis and it was huge but they were talking about a major surgery before and we've been able to buy a lot of time and actually i've been able to switch him to a waterproof cast so he can actually go in the water um, I don't do that in the really young kids where I'm trying to cure them, but I do think that's something that you can do in some of those older kids um, where you are um, holding them in place. Um, and, and so, yeah. Dr. Lee, any questions? Yes, I have a few. With, with uh, EIS for the adolescents, um, you know, with outcomes, with bracing and surgery, it doesn't matter. It's the flexibility of the curve that seems to dictate how much correction you get. I didn't realize uh, even with uh, infants or young kids, you can have quite stiff curves as well. Uh, and that, and that's yeah. why you, so you're with traditional bracing for older individuals, you know, they, they, they shoot for a 50% curve correction as well. Is that mm -hmm. where, because uh, trying to figure out the timeline, it was bracing was, the casting was for adults, and it came back to kids and it's back to adults. So it seems to be a moving target over the last 150 years, right? But it does yeah. seem that that curve correction is huge in terms of, of whether the spine is flexible or not. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And so basically I think what we're ultimately coming down to is a couple of things. One, if the curve is really flexible, it means you can unload that bone, right? You can take the pressure off the inside of the curve. If it's really rigid, you can't. You're not actually taking that pressure off. And so it doesn't allow the power of growth to work. Um, and so the other thing is that it's also a sign of a good brace or a good cast, right? Mm -hmm. So it's simply the flexibility, it's also the technique. So it's a little bit of both of those things. Um, and, and I think that, you know, with casting, again, you take that compliance out of that. And, you know, one of the things I tell all of the families is, uh, especially with your first cast, they, your kid is going to be mad. Like, if you think about it, no toddler likes to be contained. 
if I even would like try to squeeze my boys and be like, and hug them and like put a thousand kisses on them when they didn't want me to, they would be like, oh, mom, no, right? So you're doing this like a hundred times more <laughs> with this gas. But we also know that kids are really dynamic. So you're going to have a kid who's going to be totally grouchy for like the first couple of days, and then they're going to be over it uh, because they're just going to move on. They're going to realize that it's part of their new existence. And, and most of the time, they're fine after that. Um, and maybe a little grouchy with a new cast, but that typically only lasts for a few hours. Every once in a while, like the in the beginning, it, because of the pressure on around the belly, they some kids might struggle a little bit with like eating for a day or two um, but typically that's just the first cast and after that it does get a lot better um, but with a brace because you can take it off one of the problems that really happens is that um, they know it can come off mm -hmm. kids are smart kids are really smart they know that brace can come off and they're like they just keep fighting you about it and so, and that just is really tough. So the families that are successful with bracing are typically the ones who just, you just do it all the time, especially in really young kids. It's off for bath and it's on the rest of the time. And, and that can just be tough to do, you know? And so with casting, um, I think it just makes that easier. And then also when you transition from a cast to a brace, the kids are just used to it being on all the time. So actually bracing is easy because they don't know better. You know, they're actually like, this is amazing. There's freedom. Now with, um, with bracing, uh, there's, there's not a lot of research indicating whether or not, uh, you know, when you, when the cast comes off perhaps, but when uh, bracing comes off for adolescents um, and there's atrophy to their, you know, core muscles and their paraspinal muscles, uh, does that cause a little bit of a sloughing off or a little bit of an aggravation of the curve as a result? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's a little different in the younger kids than it is in older kids because they're just so much more active, you know? Um, so a lot of times in older kids, I see that when you first take the brace off, they talk a lot about back pain. Um, you know, it's not all older kids, but definitely there's a subset of them that their core got weak, that they come out of the brace, and they just hurt for a little while. So sometimes you really need to wean them out of it. So that way their core gets a little stronger and a little stronger and a little stronger. Um, and then they don't hurt. I never see that in little kids. And I think that's just because in general, young kids are so active that even though they're in a brace, they're really using those muscles. Um, but it's certainly always a concern. For me, um, in the beginning, that again, that brace is on all the time and it is exerting more pressure, but we've gotten them straight. So it doesn't have to quite be the same as the bracing for the adolescents. Okay. Now, a question I have is about when you're wearing a cast so long, <laughs> for so long, right? How do you manage it with, in terms of, I know you try to give the baths, you get your fingers in between if you can, but I can't, it's, it's as a parent, I'm going, holy smokes, it's, it's hard enough when you don't have a, a toddler in a cast in terms of trying to keep things clean. I guess it's a whole new, way of life you have to you have to kind of manage that yeah yeah and you know I am so lucky because I have some amazing amazing mm -hmm. patients and one of my favorite patients her mom is a nurse and she educated me <laughs> you know we can learn so much from families uh, because I think a lot of surgeons out there just are like okay I did what I did for the scoliosis go keep it dry keep it clean and you and then the families are like oh god <laughs> You know, and so um, we have put together handouts that we give our families, and then she and I put together that video, which is, like I said, mentioned before, is on that OrthoKids website. So it's, uh, I think it's orthokids.org, and if you look under uh, the early onset scoliosis category, you'll see it. It's down at the bottom, um, but it talks a lot about all the different things you can do. So one, as I mentioned, in the youngest kids, plaster just gets a different mold. And if I'm really shooting for a cure, I think that plaster just does a better job. If the curve is smaller, I probably don't need the plaster, but especially if the curve is bigger, it just allows me to do a better job. So those, you can't get wet at all. So now what do you do? Well, one, we put a special t-shirt on underneath and this is actually, uh, has silver in it and silver is a nat natural antibacterial substance. 
And so it helps minimize those rashes and stuff, but we give the, them an extra shirt and we show them some YouTube videos on how to take that shirt on and off. And it takes a long time. <laughs> In the beginning, the first time you do it, it'll take like 10 minutes. And then after a while, it takes like one or two. Um, but, but changing the shirt out really does help uh, to minimize those rashes and stuff. And at some point, every kid's gonna spit up on their sh shirt and on their cast. Um, at some point, they're gonna pee or poop on it. Um, we like to cover ours with duct tape and we tuck the duct tape on the underside too. So when that happens, you can actually teach the families how to take the duct tape off. And then you can kind of clean it a little bit with some soap and water if it's not too bad and then dry it out with a hairdryer um, and then put that back on. Again, just a tiny bit. You don't want it to get like so damp is what you're looking for, just barely damp. Um, you know, and that's something that's really reasonable to try to do. Um, actually, another thing that's really great is there are art smocks out there that have a little snap at the neck um, or, and they have elastic at the, at the wrist. And if you put that on the buttons in the back, then uh, it's easy to do mealtime and not get food in your cast. It's easy to do art. You know, you can play with paint. You can even play with water table um, because, and have their hands and stuff get wet. Um, so I think things like that really do help. Thank goodness that little kids don't have body odor. Because <laughs> like, could you imagine this on a teenager? Oh my God, <laughs> like, that would be horrible. Um, the first cast, I typically change my first cast uh, around four or five weeks because it's a learning curve and everybody gets the first cast super dirty. It's totally gross, but you learn. And so the other cast, it's better and better until you're like a pro at it. So it, it is something where uh, together we can kind of do this and, and we hope to like support the families through the process. And that's part of why we put all this stuff out there on the internet because we realized there were so many people beyond our reach that maybe weren't getting those tips and tricks. Um, so. Now it seems like uh, a bit of a steep learning curve for surgeons, right? Because yeah, uh, you're dealing with multiple uh, age groups. Um, you you need to see experience there. You know how each child goes through their different stages. Is there how how do you pass that down to other surgeons? How do you how do you teach other surgeons this this type of method? And how did you sure. learn it? Like I said, so I'm really lucky because again, Min Meta taught multiple mentors of mine. So. You know, in Chicago, I work with Dr. Kim Hammerberg, who is just a spectacular individual, a spectacular surgeon. Um, and, and we would do eight casts in a day. And that's a ton, um, you know, and, and really just doing it again and again and again. And then I went and worked with Jacques Destou, and he was actually the first person in the US to do this procedure. So he had decades worth of experience. He had trained with Dubousset. He had trained with Dr. Meta, and so he he really understood the fundamentals of why we need to do this, and he actually worked with the Infantile Scoliosis Outreach Program when it first uh, when he first brought it to the U.S. And so a lot of people came to him from around the world, and he just really trained me, just doing so many together, really making sure that we were um, doing it right. But I'll say my first few cast, some of them were not pretty. Oh, dear God, <laughs> like, I had some shoulder straps real high, um, you know, but but now we've really got that down to the science and we do teach residents and fellows here and there's for other surgeons, there's some great videos out there now. So back in the day, there wasn't all these incredible resources on the internet. Now there's a lot of videos. The, I think the hardest part about this is there's a lot that's not tangible. There's a lot that you can't verbally say there's a lot that you can't even assess from a cast, uh, uh, even from the x-ray. Um, and I think that that's where going somewhere and working with somebody, uh, you know, when I teach the fellows, I'll actually put my hands on top of their hands, uh, which, you know, you're in a tight quarter, so that, you know, it <laughs> can be tough, but I'll put my hands on their hands and I'll show them how much pressure I'm doing, you know, um, and, and it's a lot more than they would do. Um, so I think that that kind of experience can be huge and it can really help to teach you those things that you are harder to express otherwise. If you're gonna make a ballpark guess, how many casts do you think you've done over the years? 
Oh God. Um, I mean, you know, I typically do at least one a week, uh, two a week. So, you know, um, certainly not as much as I had done historically, but it waxes and wanes. Like there are other times when I'll do two or three in a week. Um, and so it seems like there's always a season for scoliosis and a whole bunch of kids will show up in my clinic and I'll be doing them all the time. But I've done probably hundreds and hundreds of casts at this point. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's, I think the only thing that I can potentially cure for scoliosis, and it's like the worst thing of scoliosis, like this is what can profoundly affect their whole life. So to like be able to like turn that around is just so incredible. When you're doing the, uh, the casting, do you just do an AP x-ray or do you do laterals as well? Because, you know, as you know, the sagittal curve is, is huge. And how do you try to manage that when you're trying to cast a three-dimensional body? Totally, that's such a great question. So um, infantile idiopathic, it's uh, always hypothetic. Um, and so we don't typically actually get lateral x-rays for those because it's a function of the derotation. So, um, you know, kind of across the board at this point, I don't know many people that get lateral x-rays for those young kids. And part of that is because uh, they're so radiosensitive. So every x-ray is much more significant in that age group. Um, and so I think we're all universally trying to expose these kids as little as possible. Um, for kids that have kyphosis, uh, then I absolutely will do that. But again, a lot of times what I'm doing is based on a clinical exam. So I actually have the families take pictures of their children. And what we do is we look at where they were at every visit and we look at where they are now and, and see where we're going. And then typically I only get x-rays either when we're changing directions um, or um, you know, basically eight months to a year. Um, because I really, you know, what will that extra x-ray give me? What information is it going to provide me? Is it going to stop me from casting? If it is, then it's worth it. If it's going to make me change my tactic because the curve got too big, then it's worth it. But otherwise, it's probably not going to do anything beneficial, and it's actually kind of harmful. So do you find that when you're actually doing a casting that, yes, you're applying pressure, well, you're elongating with traction, you're applying pressure to derotate, um, and then you're flexing. Do you find that that pretty well coincides with just trying to get the, uh, the cast symmetrical? Yeah, so uh, it almost looks like a corset. You know, you're gonna get a real indentation at the waist. Um, so when I position the child on the bed, um, one of the things that I want to do is I want to make sure that their hips are really level. Because if their hips aren't level when I position them, then they're never going to be level uh, because the cast is going to be asymmetric. So putting, making sure that position is critically important. And then in all honesty, I lift as hard as I possibly can. <laughs> you know? So, um, and, and we see that in a couple of different ways where in the very young kids, you start to lift them off the bed. So actually somebody is pushing the shoulder down. So what they'll do is somebody will hold them at the waist and somebody will hold them at the shoulder and I lift in between so that we actually untwist the spine. If somebody's not holding them at the shoulders, then I just twist them on the bed and that doesn't do anything. Uh, so it is, it's, it's pretty interesting that way um, that just subtle differences and, and you see it in the kids' weight. So like the older kids, I am like, I need to work out for them. And the younger kids, it is that finesse of making sure, okay, they're not levitating. Okay. I guess what I was asking is uh, when you're derotating and everything, does the cast kind of turn out completely symmetrical uh, in or do you use this, that symmetry left to right in terms of yeah, the balance so, of the guide? Great, so subtly different. So no, it doesn't necessarily wind up perfectly symmetrical because sometimes what I want is I want to open them up on the inside of the curve. So sometimes the outside of the curve may be actually a little flatter as I'm trying to push and kind of derotate that. It depends on the size of the curve. So if it's a bigger curve, it's less likely to have a perfectly symmetrical cast. If it's a smaller curve, it's more likely to. Um, and then the other thing that we'll do is we'll actually make a big cutout in the back 
And that actually allows the curve to derotate into on the other side, so the opposite side of the curve. It's a challenging technique because you have to kind of, you know, picture what everything's doing and you have to trust your instincts and and you have to have really amazing confidence to say, okay, we're just going to cast this and uh, we'll see how that turns out, you know, in about three months. It's, I can see why it's difficult to do and why um, you have to almost find a master caster. <laughs> Is that a word? We should put that on a t-shirt for you, by the way. We should, I would love that t-shirt. I would love it all the time. <laughs> for that particular surgeon to get the results. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, so, so I think um, one, it's always great to, to go to a master caster. Um, there are master casters all over this country. And, and again, making sure that they have experience, I think is incredibly beneficial um, because we do know that if your child is less than 18 months of age, their potential for a cure is much higher. So going to the wrong person and burning that time when they're growing so fast is bad. There, that is harmful. Um, I think that it is a technique that um, a lot of people can learn. And so, you know, they're, especially somebody who is coming out of a place where they've done a lot of them, they may be younger. And in fact, some of the younger surgeons are more likely to have learned this technique. So it's not necessarily a function of the gray hair, which by the way, I die away. Uh, you know, like, um, but, but that is something where, you know, um, you can be any age. Um, getting that x-ray, seeing that, x that first x-ray in cast, knowing that they got that appropriate correction, I think is helpful. And then you said three months. So for me, it's variable. So that first cast is typically four weeks. Then the other thing is that the little kids, especially, or your first cast or two, kids tend to go through a growth spurt. I just had a kiddo who it was between his second and third cast. He gained three pounds in three weeks. That's insane. You know, he went through a huge growth spurt and his cast got way too tight. So what I try to do is I change the cast. Uh, I want to wait as long as possible, but I want the cast to always be as tight as possible. So I teach families what to look for, for when it's getting too tight. And typically that's going to be, they're not eating as big a meal. So, and they're snacking a lot more. Um, that's typically a sign of it. Um, and, and so I always ask families at each visit, how were they doing with eating the last time? And, and knowing that kids grow in spurts. So like you may not grow for two or three weeks and then you grow a ton and then you don't grow for a little bit and then you grow a ton. And so, you know, being flexible about that, I think is really important. Older kids, it's more predictable and older kids, you can spread it out more and more. So in young kids, typically the cast changes are occurring about every six weeks in my hand. And I have some older kids where we spread it out to as much as four months. Uh, so. So that, that is variable. And I also always tell them, I can apply a cast after clinic, before clinic, it doesn't take me that long. So my door is always open and, and, and you could just give me a call and I can get you on typically within about a week or two pretty easily, um, you know, so they know the signs to look for because we, again, educate them a bunch. Now, I'm, I know I'm gonna get uh, responses to this video in terms of, uh... Is there a list of master casters in North America that you might have handy? No, no, but I think that um, one, you can always look to see who's published on this topic. So you don't have to be have access to medical journals, but you can do a Google search. You can see who's published on this. And if they've published on it, they probably have done a fair amount. You know, I think you can ask them. You can ask them if they've done a lot of casting. Um, in general, they're probably going to be at an academic center because this is a rarer disorder. Um, so this is infantile idiopathic is about 1% of all scoliosis. So it's much, much less common. Um, and I think, you know, and I'm, I think they're incredibly empowering. There's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of support groups out there. You always have to be careful and take stuff with a grain of salt because, you know, um, but I think that that can sometimes connect you with people in your region, um, and that can be beneficial as well. Um, 
but there, but there's a lot of great people out there. The other thing is, is that um, there's the pediatric spine study group. So this has 150 surgeons in it, um, and it's all surgeons that do tend to focus more on younger kids. Um, and so I think that if it's somebody who's a part of that group, you've probably got a pretty good chance they're pretty experienced with younger kids with scoliosis and not just our typical adolescent kiddo. If we can switch topics to um, your um, uh, the collagen biomarker test. Because um, I do get questions all the time in terms, and I tell them, yes, it's going through the FDA study right now. Are the results still quite good? Are you happy with the results? And when do you, yeah. more, more importantly, when do you foresee the test being available? Yeah, so I, you know, I think I told you last time, about two or three years, and it's, it's probably still about that. You know, again, part of this is that we just really have to make sure that everything is as good as it seems. Um, and so right now there's a couple different ways that you can uh, have access to that. So that's, so one, you can participate in the bigger study. So the bigger study, which is to say the one that's more involved with the biomarker, and we've got five sites now. So that can be through the Shriners Hospital in Philadelphia, uh, University of North Carolina. Um, it, it can be through the Shriners Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, the Shriners Hospital in Pasadena or here in Portland. Um, so you can participate in that study. And then what we're doing is we're actually tracking you over time, which is awesome. Uh, I know that you are very passionate about vertebral body tethering. And so actually as part of the um, approval of that and this post um, FDA approval, they're studying it. And um, one of the things that we're doing is that for anybody who is uh, taken care of by a physician who's in the pediatric spine study group, uh, they can also have access to the biomarker now. So now that's obviously older patients, um, but what they're doing is they're doing it less frequently. They're doing it every six months um, before and after tethering. Um, and we're using that hopefully to pinpoint what the right time is because it's the same concept, right? Tethering is the same concept as casting. You're harnessing that power of growth and changing it from that vicious cycle where it's getting worse all the time, but you're to a virtuous cycle where you're unloading the inside, allowing that growth to catch up to the outside and, and correcting that curve permanently. Well, thank you, Dr. Wellborn, for your time and your presentation. It was very enlightening. Uh, we're just going to get that out there and educate the world on... Um, EDF casting, metacasting. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, anytime and please, any questions or anything, I'm happy to have uh, you or other people reach out uh, because I, this is a topic that I'm so passionate about. And just like you, you know, anything that we can do to educate people, to empower people, um, because I think that's so critically important and, and making sure that they are getting that good cast, that they're not losing that critical window. Um, and, and potentially, you know, either curing their scoliosis or at least making it a whole lot better for a long time uh, would be really amusing. So, so nice to talk to you, Derek, you and a cool day. You too. Thanks very much.